Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, our first event of the Just Streets Safe and Equitable Mobility in our Community Series. This series is co-sponsored by the Kerwin Institute on Race and Ethnicity. Today's guest, Destiny de Guzman, will provide a high-level overview of a methodology for reparative planning while also equipping attendees with concepts and frameworks for activating communities in a way that centers their lived experience and cultural histories. My name is Jerrica Logan and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as CURA. I will be your host for this event. If you require closed captioning, you will find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click the box and select show subtitles. This will allow you to see subtitles during the presentation. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, we do apologize. If you have any additional questions following the event, please feel free to email me at logan.433 at osu.edu. This event is approved for one AICP CM credit. To claim your CM credits, log into the My APA account on the APA website and enter it into your online CM event log. There will also be a brief survey at the end of the webinar. If you have time, please provide your feedback. To learn more about Cura's future events or sign up for our monthly newsletter, visit cura.osu.edu. You can also like Cura on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Also, don't miss out on our next event on October 20th with, uh, with Jesse Singer for There Are No Accidents, Racism, Poverty, and the Illusion of Human Error in America's Traffic and Accident Epi Epidemic. I'm now going to pass it over to Kerwin Director Ange Marie Hancock. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Jerrica. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Ange Marie Hancock and I'm the new executive director of the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University. I joined the university in January after 15 years at the University of Southern California. Uh, and um, I'm very, very excited about Kerwin's collaboration with Cura on this series this fall. Um, and very grateful to uh, Jerrica and Harvey Miller um, for inviting us to kind of include this as part of our ongoing Kerwin Forum series that we do every academic year. I have the pleasure and the honor of moderating today's uh, conversation, um, and I am thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Destiny de Guzman. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Thrivance Group, which is a multi-regional, socially responsible, for-profit firm that works to make public spaces and public services more safe, healthy, and accessible, especially for Black, Indigenous, and transgender people and those with disabilities. Dr. de Guzman earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Fisk University in 2006, a Master of Public Administration with an emphasis in public health and nonprofit management from Tennessee State University in 2008, and a PhD in Social and Cultural Anthropology from the California Institute of Integral Studies in 2016. She is a creative who seeks to embody servant leadership and is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Dr. de Guzman is a sociocultural anthropologist with over 15 years of experience developing equitable systems in government and nonprofit spaces. Her methods include dignity infused community engagement, participatory governance, interdisciplinary praxis, critical race theory, gender studies, and anti-displacement. Having worked extensively in civil service at Caltrans, which is the California Department of Transportation as an environmental planner with a special focus on indigenous communities and at the Los Angeles Department of Transportation as a lead on community engagement, Dr. de Guzman is dedicated to achieving equitable transportation governance and reparative transportation planning. 
I'm going to turn it over to Dr. de Guzman. Um, and as Jerrica said, we'll have about 30 to 35 minutes of presentation. Please use the Q&A feature for any questions that you would like Dr. de Guzman to answer. And we will go ahead and moderate that part of the conversation once she's done presenting. So Dr. de Guzman, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Excited to be here. I'm going to sort of do a little bit of storytelling today. Um, I am delighted to share more about our reparative planning strategy that we've been working on at the Thrivance Group for a number of years now. And it comes by way of us sort of being known for a style of community engagement that that we find to be unique and different from what you would typically see in, for instance, a civil service setting. And so, um, excuse me, give me one second. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today or what we'll focus on today is this distinction between community engagement and community building. And so a lot of times I hear from people who are wanting to do um, exciting, exciting methods for community, community engagement. They want to see thousands of people come out. They want to send out thousands of surveys. They want to get everyone to say yes to their projects. And they want to do some consistent, consensus building activities. And um, somewhere we kind of lost our way as an industry, as a sector those of us who do built sciences. So transportation planning, um, housing planning, city planning, uh, we all kind of lost our way with, the, with the, the sort of data frenzy, the desire to be able to say, we touched a certain number of people or asked a certain number of people questions. Um, community engagement, typically how we would see that defined is um, maybe you have sort of a preconceptual phase of a project where we have an idea based on the funding mechanism that we have um, of you know what's what neighborhood we want to interact with the specific project and maybe some high level um, notions of what the project elements would be um, and we take that to the community we inform them we ask for their feedback Maybe if we have the resources, we make a couple of changes to the project. Uh, and then maybe if we have resources, we go back out to the public with um, those changes, ask for feedback again, and then we call our community engagement work complete. So um, what's problematic about that, and which we've seen is that we're seeing more and more what, what are known as um, unintended consequences. We're seeing communities experiencing rapid rates of gentrification and displacement. We're seeing an uptick in policing and criminalization of mobility in our neighborhoods. We are also seeing um, an increase in uh, respiratory illnesses because we haven't quite um, been able to wrap our heads around um, the climate, climate impacts associated with our work. And we're also seeing uh, people just become sort of apathetic about civic engagement altogether. And I believe that it's because our um, current mode of doing community engagement lacks a moral compass. Uh, what I mean by that is we are very altruistic, right? And there's this, there's this theory or this concept um, called pathological altruism, which is basically the notion that the idea that you want to do a common good, right? You want to do a good in society and you want to do it so bad that your focus on doing the good thing is narrow, right? So you set on, on this, set out on this path to have a positive impact and you get to a point where you you are striving toward that positive outcome or that positive impact uh, at all costs. And so the outcome tends to be that, yeah, maybe you have this one beneficiary of this project that you set out to, to implement, 
or maybe you have what is known as a net a net benefit. A net positive is um, where we know that there are trade offs to the work that we do, but when we uh, look at it um, with a, li- a wide lens, we find that the majority of people have had some kind of positive benefit or positive outcome associated with the work that we've done. And the what's problematic about that is that in community, the purpose of community engagement or community engagement was introduced to our sector for the purposes of bolstering equity, right? We want more equitable outcomes. When you think about the definition of um, equity, oftentimes these definitions include phrases like we want to serve those who are underrepresented or we want to serve those who are marginalized. Well, what does it mean to be marginalized? It means to literally be on the margins, right? So if we're implementing projects in a matter in a manner that results in uh, net benefit, right? The majority benefits from what we're doing, then instead of reaching those on the margins, we're actually further marginalizing them, right? So what's missing in our community engagement work is actually community. Um, So I want to start with a quick definition of what we mean when we say the word community. Community is not the um, sort of geographic boundaries that are drawn around the neighborhoods that we serve. It's not even a collection of or collective of neighbors who all happen to live in the same area. Community could be um, a a legacy of people who, despite having been displaced and dispersed geographically, um, are still one with each other, right? So that's, that is what we call being of community, not necessarily being in community. Um, community, especially in this day and age, could also be a political identity, right? An affinity based on an ideology. Community could mean a number of things. And our approaches to community engagement must be contextually appropriate um, or aligned with which version of community we're seeking to engage. So I wanna tell you um, an anecdotal story to help uh, illustrate the point that I'm trying to make here. I worked at the Los Angeles Department of Transportation in 2015. I started working there in 2015 and they hired me I think because I um, had made a name for myself in the city of Los Angeles for doing community engagement, not necessarily community engagement around urban planning or transportation, but just community engagement in in general. And in fact, at the time I was specializing in domestic violence intervention and working with young people who are aging out of or transitioning out of uh, foster care. And So I was conducting these spaces that I referred to as healing circles. And we would gather once a week, myself and a group of uh, moms from South Central LA um, would gather once a week and I would sort of interview them about their experiences with trauma. And more specifically, I was interested in understanding the relationship between trauma and the built environment. And as you can imagine, in a metropolitan area like Los Angeles, a lot of the trauma that we talked about um, amounted to uh, gun violence and over-policing, major health crises, also some immigration challenges as well. And what I found through that process actually um, was that I would leave those spaces feeling very heavy and very depressed. In fact, I had to seek therapy um, during that time because emotionally being privy to all of the atrocities happening in my own community was taking its toll on me. And my therapist at the time said to me, you know, Destiny, if you're leaving these spaces feeling traumatized and heavy and sad and depressed, it's possible that other people are also leaving those spaces, feeling these things. And if your goal is to be helpful, if your goal is to heal, if your goal is to help people um, sort of evolve from the trauma that they've experienced, then you're gonna have to find a way to engage them 
um, without harming them. And that was when the first time I took a step back and really intentionally thought about what does it look like to approach community engagement around topics that are heavy um, from a harm reductive standpoint. So fast forward to me working at LADOT, bringing this thrivance based framework into my community engagement work. The concept, the idea was that um, understanding how intersectionality works. And for those of you who don't, a quick primer on that is uh, theoretically, there are many types of um, systems of oppression that all of us are experiencing in, in this society every day, right? Pretend my fingers are the tentacles of oppression. And maybe, you know, eight of these type, these structures, uh, these systems of oppression are systems that I experience and encounter or are imposed upon me every day, right? The idea is that those systems overlap. Right. So just because I'm black, I might have a certain lived experience um, that is associated with oppression. But when you couple that with the fact that I am black and a woman, then that creates a unique set of oppressions that is different from what a woman might experience who's not black or what a black person might experience who's not a woman. And then when you add a cognitive disability to that, um, it becomes even more unique when you add maybe uh, me, me, the fact that I grew up in a low wealth, health, wealth household, that creates a new set of oppressions, right? And all of these combinations of oppression overlap and, 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 and are imposed onto us as individuals in, a, in ways that create unique experiences, right? That's the intersectional identity. When you hear the term intersectionality, that's what that's about. Understanding that theory, I asked myself, well, if there are overlapping systems of oppression that cause us to experience harm and trauma, then I wonder if there were, if there are um, also overlapping characteristics about us culturally, intellectually, emotionally, even physically, that cause us to thrive. And what would it look like if I engaged people at the intersection of their thrivance as opposed to at the intersection of their oppression. And so all of my community engagement methodologies stem from this, this important question. Uh, what is it about us as individuals, but more importantly as communities that causes us to thrive um, despite of, but also independent of the various forms of oppression that we may be experiencing. So this is the framework that I bring to transportation and urban planning. Well, a lot of people were not fond of that because what it meant was in the civil service setting, I'm taking my time. I want to get to know people. I'm having coffees with Ms. Jackson on the corridor. I'm going for long walks in the middle of the day. Um, I'm not just uh, showing up to neighborhoods as an observer. I'm showing up to neighborhoods as a participant, um, sometimes as an insider participant and sometimes as an outsider partici participant. And when I'm asked to do community engagement as a, as a part of a larger planning exercise, the community engagement is often the component that consumes the uh, bulk of our time and a significant amount of our resources. Uh, I refused in that in that capacity to do uh, transportation planning in any other way. So a lot of people think that I come come into this space as an engagement planner when really um, I'm an environmental planner. I've been a liaison to indigenous communities in the state of California for many years um, as an environmental planner. I'm also a technically trained um, transportation planner, and my background is in anthropology. I just happen to do my work um, in a way that centers community engagement. So I always tell people that I'm not a community engagement expert per se, but I got in trouble for lack of a better term because I refused to um, 
do these projects in a way that was efficient or what what the system that I worked for defined as efficient. And one of the projects that um, that I will always carry with me in my heart and in my mind in doing doing this work is our work on Avalon Boulevard. And Avalon Boulevard was a 15 mile long project. It spanned 15 miles of one streak that went from nearly uh, downtown Los Angeles all the way to Watts. If anyone is familiar with with that city, is that's a large stretch. And what was inherently problematic about approaching communi- community engagement on that project was um, 15 miles could be 50 different so-called communities, right? The community located at mile two is not going to be the same community located at mile 15. But I have w- one pot of money, um, one window of, of opportunity to engage folks about one project that is imposing a single um, design package across the entire span. So the first thing that I did was I uh, hired what we called a dignity team at the time. And um, those were people who were, uh, who would otherwise not have access to employment and who were from and living in these various neighborhoods. So we had young people aging out of foster care. We had people with severe cognitive disabilities we have former veterans. We had survivors of inter- intimate partner violence. Um, we had people with drug and alcohol addictions. Um, and we created a space that was just for the Dignity Team outside of our company, our agency offices, where we met almost every day. We talked about how we were experiencing our communities. And collectively, Um, As residents who were being paid to steer the community engagement process, we were able to come up with an approach to community engagement. So we divided the corridor up into 30 different communities, and we were intentional enough to plan 30 different community engagement strategies to cover that span of corridor. There was one community, I would say probably at the five mile mark on Avalon Boulevard that um, really tugged at my heartstrings because um, that particular neighborhood had not seen any kind of investment in infrastructure in at least 40 years, in some places, 60 years. So where we are talking about reconfiguring the street and adding a protected bike lane here and putting a median here and, red uh, flashing beacons over there, all of what we would consider at the time um, innovative transportation elements. We're throwing them, you know, into this community that hasn't seen investment in many years. Well, it only took us going out to that neighborhood twice to notice that um, the old so-called outdated transportation elements were not maintained, nor were they working or or functioning properly. Um, So it might be more cost effective and it might be more dignifying for the community um, to just maintain and repair the infrastructure that's there. And and I got a lot of pushback inside of the agency about this approach because, um, you know, we wanted to be known as an agency that was doing work equitably, and we didn't know how to answer the question of um, why our investment, so to speak, in this one neighborhood would be um, lower, fiscally lower than in other neighborhoods. So it took a lot of coaxing um, on my part to, to get people to understand that the investment is not just the dollars. You're also investing in people's propensity to thrive. And in order to thrive, people need to feel dignified, number one. And number two is they need to be a part of a, they need to feel and know that they are part of a community that is safe for them. And so um, we, after interviewing, I would say over 300 residents in this one, one of 30 something neighborhoods, uh, we realized that 
one priority that everyone could pretty much coalesce around was that we wanted young people to be safer walking and riding their bike in this neighborhood. So we had a children's fair as our first community engagement activation. And we went through all the processes of closing the street down and getting our permits to have our event, setting up our DJ booth, getting the food, the food trucks out there, setting up our tables with the balloons and the clowns. And we even created a, um, a toddler sized experience of the built environment or excuse me, the inverse of that. We scaled everything up so that um, tall people and adults could experience the environment the way toddlers and short people experience the environment because we felt like that perspective was missing from the, from the discussion. When we went to set up that day for the event, uh, we pulled up at the same time as the permit crew who comes out and, you know, cites the tickets on the cars who haven't moved from the parking spaces and puts the cones out and telling people that there's no through traffic. And we watch one of the permit crew members approach a car that was still parked in the, in the project area, um, bang on the window and ask them, you know, demand that they leave. And out of the van came a woman carrying an infant in her arms. And she looked at the crew member and she said, you know, I live here, this is my home. And as someone who thinks they're very uh, self-righteous and self-aware, um, I had not considered up until that point that even though we were intending to do a good thing that day, something that would benefit like from a net positive perspective, the community that we're in, that there would be people on the margins who would be harmed by our altruistic efforts. So, um, of course, we intervened and we spoke with the with the woman um, and she said, you know, I don't mind moving, but the way you're going about it doesn't feel dignifying. And I agreed with that. So um, we she she actually became uh, a very um, fond friend and partner in the work um, that day forward. We broke bread together. We ate. Uh, she was an integral part of the event later that day. I met a young woman at our feedback booth. Uh, I think she was about seven years old. And at our booth, we were asking a simple question, right? What is it that you love about your neighborhood? And another question was, what makes you feel safe in your neighborhood? These were two questions that we were posing to the young people who were in attendance of our children's fair. And there was one young woman who every time we asked her, what, where do you feel safe or how do you feel safe or what feels safe or what would feel safe in your neighborhood, no matter how many times we rephrase the question, this young, young lady would always respond with say, by saying, I feel safe in the house. And we were thinking, oh, she doesn't understand. Like we're talking about not just your house as the neighborhood, but the sidewalk or at the park. And she she said, no, I understand. I feel safe in the house. And specifically, she said she felt safe in the back of the house. And what we realized was that our definition of safety did not take into account the contextual uh, definition or understanding of safety for that community. Uh, she felt safe in the house because this is a community that often has um, vehicle crashes in the intersection right in front of her door. Um, sometimes they have um, gun violence in the neighborhood. And then other times there might just be um, things in the street or on the ground that are difficult, make it difficult for her as a smaller person to navigate. So this was the second epiphany that we had that day that um, one, our altruism could be harmful, but two, that um, our transportation safety efforts um, would ultimately fail this neighborhood because we hadn't taken into account 
um, that there were other safety priorities that needed to really be resolved or at least meaningfully handled um, before we could get to a conversation about where to put a bike lane. So Avalon Boulevard was the project that got me to thinking about um, in what other ways are we meaning to do a good thing in our work, but actually that work is resulting in harm. And so there are five engagement, community engagement tactics that I believe actually um, harm communities as opposed to helping them. Number one on my list is pilot projects. Pilot projects like um, we used to do uh, pop-up roundabouts if we were thinking about putting a roundabout at an intersection to slow or calm traffic. Uh, we would just install a temporary one and stand out there, you know, with donuts and coffee um, and help people cross the street through them and, and, you know, direct traffic around them. And aesthetically, they were a, a very beautiful, it was a very beautiful activity to take part in, right? To see the the neighborhood transform overnight and, and to um, see residents inquiring about and becoming interested in. Um, these new transportation elements. But what I noticed was we would leave those moments with the sort of data from the feedback from people. And we would use that data to um, support our argument in favor of a permanent intervention. Now, what's problematic about that is we are not being honest with communities about what the other impacts of this transportation element will be. When you have this roundabout, um, this new roundabout in your community, the walk score goes up, right? The, there's now um, more room for connecting a bike network in the neighborhood. And these things are great, don't get me wrong. Maybe you're even getting investments in things like curb ramps because of it. But these upgrades also spur um, housing speculation, right? Because these improvements are coming to neighborhoods, especially like neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods like Avalon, where we haven't seen improvement in decades, the, the, the value of the neighborhood, the um, value in terms of real estate of the neighborhood is going to increase drastically. And so real estate investors and other people who play in the real estate marketplace um, will see that and they will begin to, to make decisions in that community uh, that affect people in very harmful ways, right? So rent is going up. We see rent burden increasing. Um, maybe we start to see early people moving in, early uh, wave of gentrification, which also leads oftentimes to some cultural conflicts. We've seen the term Karen thrown around over the last few years. Um, and then you have uh, city agencies and county agencies walking around with these projects bo project boards saying that 85% of this neighborhood, um, this community within a one mile radius of this intervention said that they wanted it, right? And it's really unfair and disingenuous because we just said that we wanted coffee today and that we enjoyed walking through your pop-up roundabout demonstration. We did not say that we were open to being displaced, right? So pilot projects in the absence of a critical analysis and in the absence of holistic interventions that help um, stabilize the neighborhood around them are not helpful, they are harmful. Um, another community engagement tactic similar to pilot project is rapid intervention. Uh, we have a sense of urgency when we experience um, traffic related um, injuries or death and that's understandable. Um, we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we are still in, but in the beginning of it, many cities across the country said, you know what, because this is happening and because people have a, a need and desire to be able to be socially distant, but still uh, remain uh, physically active, we are going to do slow streets. We're gonna close down streets to through traffic so that people can use the streets in ways that they haven't been able to use them before. So we saw alfresco dining pop up. We saw, um, you know, we saw play streets pop up more frequently. And again, 
these interventions are great, but the sort of dark underbelly of this is that we also saw an uptick in policing, right? We, we, we had these um, sandwich signs, which gave permission to local police to pull over cars to question them about whether or not they were residents, actual residents on the street, right? Um, so we see people being more traumatized, people who are also more likely to die from or be impacted from the pandemic itself, um, essential workers, for example, being traumatized by an intervention that we um, threw money at in the name of helping this same group of people. Um, a third engagement tactic that is actually more harmful than helpful is the overuse of canned, canned intervention frameworks like Vision Zero or like Promise Zones or, um, or Choice Neighborhoods. These frameworks are helpful because we're able to use um, tried and true or tested um, project elements um, and, and to intervene efficiently. But what's problematic about them is that we're trying to fit a um, sort of design package that has worked in maybe um, Mexico City or Switzerland or Sweden uh, into a South Central LA or into an East Oakland. And we're not taking into consideration the cultural differences of the people who live there and how jarring and disruptive these processes and these interventions can be. That's just not how you choose to move or how you choose to connect with your community. The fourth thing is what I call high stakes engagement. And I'll wrap up in about five minutes here. The fourth thing is, is high stakes engagement. And this is where we have these brief or short windows of opportunity for people to engage with the project, right? There's one decision making point. If you want to provide feedback or if you have questions, we're asking everyone to come to this one open house or this one public comment period. Um, and then that's that, as opposed to an ongoing open stream of communication that's even happening uh, without having to talk about a specific project, right? right? Like what does it look like to have community engagement that is not project specific? But the high stakes engagement is particularly uh, problematic because we are asking communities to um, help us make decisions oftentimes while they are under duress, right? You know, you have a little bit, a limited amount of time. You probably won't make the best decision. You probably won't think of all of the questions that you have, or maybe there are other pressing issues like rent burden, like a, a chronic illness um, that causes you to need more time um, to really process what is happening in your neighborhood. The last engagement tactic that is actually more harmful than helpful is what I refer to as single discipline planning. So we're throwing the transportation planning um, interventions into one neighborhood while we're also seeing the Bureau of Engineers and the Parks and Recreations and the Social Services and the Mental Health Department all inundating this community in a way that leads to community engagement fatigue, decision-making fatigue. And so what we'd like to see is more collaborative, multidisciplinary um, work happening that even includes um, entities that are not rooted in civil service. So what does it look like to have an arts collective or um, a, a political advocacy, advocacy group involved in these community engagement processes, okay? We're going to talk about one intervention um, that kind of disrupts these negative um, tendencies, but there are five that I want to make you aware of that you can look up on your own, right? So harm reductive approaches, harm reduction is a framework um, that should really be at the center or core of any community engagement strategy that you developed. Develop. Transformative justice is another framework that I find is helpful when you're navigating a community that is um, um, experiencing distrust or has been harmed at the hands of local government. Um, community organizing is a mode of community engagement that allows people to show up to the process with a political identity and with a body politic that is less transactional than just asking uh, what color paint do you want to see in your intersection mural? 
Um, and then there's returning to nature, right? So the disconnect between people, communities, and nature or environment is um, in a lot of ways um, leading to or perpetuating the harm that we keep throwing interventions at. So as often as you can incorporate nature um, and the sacredness of our environment in your work, I recommend doing that. And then lastly, what we'll talk about um, right now is reparative planning. So I wanna briefly, um, um, especially and definitely with in the interest of time in mind, um, share what our framework for reparative planning looks like. And reparative planning at the Thrivance Group is exactly what it sounds like. Um, reparative planning is about offering redress for harms that communities have experienced at the hands of uh, local government or governance related decisions, okay? It's a four pronged litmus test. So anytime we wanna do engagement or implement a project, we're asking ourselves these four questions. And the first one is, um, is this policy or is this project intervention or, or um, is this community engagement strategy addressing a specific element of harm. So instead of saying, oh, we're just being equitable, we're doing equity, we're really thinking what, what was a moment in this neighborhood where harm occurred, right? Let's say we want to, we've been talking about freeways a lot lately. Let's say the introduction of a freeway into a neighborhood. Sure, harmful, but we want to be very specific, right? The freeway at what location, right? And what was the harm that resulted from that freeway showing up. The freeway itself is harmful, but in what ways? Is it is it high incidences of asthma, um, disconnect disconnect in the community, um, stalled kinship formations? Really naming the harm that has occurred, and ideally focusing on one harm, not a plethora of harms. The second thing is thinking about. Um, who specifically was harmed, right? And therefore, who should be the recipient of your issue-specific intervention? So we want to create an intervention that matches the harm that occurred. So handing out um, or, or discounting education for everyone who lives near the freeway that was installed is not a direct intervention on the specific harm that occurred, right? So we want to ask ourselves, if the harm we're talking about is um, the severance of a community, then the direct intervention needs to be about how we reform that connection, right? Not just a random, this thing is good and altruistic, so we're throwing it at this community. The third thing, especially once we've generated some preliminary ideas about what we want our in intervention to be, we're asking ourselves, Will these interventions pose an additional burden or barrier on the community that has experienced harm? Am I asking you to prove that you experienced this harm? Do you only have 20 minutes to respond? Um, am I asking you to sign up for some kind of surveillance related program where now I'm checking in with you once a month to make sure you're eligible? Those types of things create additional burdens and barriers and actually create a lot more harm than good. And then the last thing that we're asking is, okay, now that we have this concept, is the concept that we've developed actually producing a permanent redress, right? So this is where your pilot projects and rapid intervention projects are not very helpful. Um, will this intervention not only disrupt the harm that is incurring, but will it heal the people who have been harmed based on their own concept of healing and also is this going to prevent this type of harm from happening in the future? And this is where we get hung up a lot because oftentimes you have to deal with the system or the process that was in play when the harm occurred, okay? So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, this, this method was a method that's very much inspired by the young woman that I met um, on Avalon Boulevard. And just so that you know, this is a community that had maybe 500 people show up to vote for their um, local elected official in the most recent election prior to us doing the engagement. Um, but we had 10,000 people, 10,000, that's not an exaggeration, show up to the so-called open house for the Avalon Boulevard project as a result of our 18 months of intentional 
um, dignity infused community engagement process. So we'll use the rest of our time today here um, to field questions and, and um, I'll hand it back to you, Ms. Hancock, to, to help guide us through that. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, uh, Destiny, for that wonderful um, presentation. Um, I have one or two questions. I know our audience has already started to post in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to start with their question and then pivot to my question after that. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get a couple more in here as well. Um, so this one is thinking of the intervention to gentrification path, um, policing and harm from policing is of high concern. Um, and we, and we, we know this um, from the research, uh, particularly as it affects black women, um, but also as it affects a number of different folks um, in terms of high eviction rates um, based on these harms from policing. I'm wondering if there are ways to develop cohesion in the geographic community as part of the process that can be protective of that risk of over policing. Yes, excellent question. So I have two responses. The first thing is, um, as, as, a, as an abolitionist, a prison abolitionist myself, um, I really believe in a future um, without policing and without surveillance. And so one of our struggles as advocates for abolition, I have observed, has been that we are not, we're not great at offering um, viable alternatives or helping people to see what it looks like to create a world without policing. So the first thing is, um, especially through community engagement, when you're when you're having these um, safety or community or public safety conversation, um, make sure that in addition to you suggesting that there is over policing or that police is policing is harmful, make sure that you're following that up with community-based interventions um, that serve the function of safety, right? And, pro and community protection um, in ways that, that, that help people to understand and see that, that future that's really easy for us to see without policing. The second thing that I wanna offer here is um, transformative justice is different, than, different from reparative justice or restorative justice. Transformative justice um, is a process that involves the person who has caused harm, um, but centers the person who has been harmed. So I would encourage you to review um, the various emergent strategies regarding transformative justice um, to, to maybe get some ideas around um, what you can incorporate into your community engagement strategies and, and your tactics moving forward. Um, in terms of mending the distrust between communities and police, I, one, don't think it's possible, and two, I don't think it's necessary, right? Why do I need to be um, in cahoots with someone that I know um, will or has murdered someone that looks like me because they look like me? Um, I don't find that to be a necessary exercise. Um, so maybe organizing the police um, to move away from policing is probably a better strategy. That's um, the idea of trust is something that I wanted to ask briefly about, and then we'll pivot to, we have a couple more questions in the chat, um, see if we can fit them all in. Um, I, you know, you had talked about building trust and lack of trust, and it came back in your answer just now. Um, and you mentioned that without intentional attention, um, planning lacks a moral compass early on in your presentation. And I wanted to connect the dots um, between the needs for data, um, and this kind of connects to the second question that in the chat, um, that's quantitative and so-called objective, um, and how you were talking about that, um, and how that kind of has grown as a trend, right? We need more evidence, we need more evidence, we need more data, we need more evidence. Um, and I'm reminded of people like W.B. Du Bois, you know, who thought that enough evidence was eventually going to convince people that racism was wrong. Um, and what ends up happening is that the goalposts just keep moving. Um, and so we've talked a lot about how to build trust for you as a member of the government, right? LA DOT, Caltrans, et cetera, with community. Um, I'm wondering about how do we organize folks who are in the government 
um, to really understand this history of communities of color um, not being believed, right? Um, so whether it's people not being believed about the harms on their children when you locate the 110 freeway where you do, right? Um, or harms on communities when decisions are made about where to put a pre, uh, freeway and how that bisects and then creates you know, or reifies, you know, divisions that were already there in terms of resource allocation. How do we organize folks to take what the stories that you're sharing at their word? Um, how do we make sure that we're also focused not just on whether communities can trust us, but whether or not we are actually trusting what's being told to us by communities? Great question. And thank you for mentioning WEB. W.E.B. Du Bois, um, he's a Fisk guy. I went to Fisk University as well. Um, and, you know, I could say so much about data. So the first thing I want to say is quantitative data um, we know is inherently uh, racist. It's, it's um, gender exclusive. It does very little for indigenous people and very little for people with disabilities, right? Um, it, there's no human element in it. And so the question then becomes, how do we dress qualitative data up as quantitative data up? And what has been helpful for me in my work as a researcher is finding a nexus, like a, almost a somatic nexus of, of information um, that marries well with the quantitative approach but has a lot of um, qualitative value. So an example of that is we are um, dealing with, that's my husband and my baby behind me. Um, we are dealing with uh, a reduction in, in uh, transit ridership. Like transit ridership is hemorrhaging in all areas. And particularly the people who we think need transit the most are least likely to use it, right? Black folks and low wealth folks. And we're asking ourselves why, right? Because we're making it cheaper, we're making it faster, we're covering greater distances. Um, and so in asking myself this question as a researcher, I said, there must be a somatic explanation for this. And I have a hunch, right? What has happened in these neighborhoods where these transit stops are located emotionally, spiritually even, what has happened in the geography that would cause generations of people to just steer clear of them, right? And so what one exercise we did in our recent project is we took a map um, where we were seeing low transit ridership um, in several, several cities throughout the country. And we overlaid that map with data, uh, with, with historic lynching data. And we found a correlation where lynching of Black people was most likely to occur, the lynching hotspots. Um, those are also the areas where Black people are least likely to rely on transit. Now, are Black people consciously saying in 2023, someone was lynched here, a man was lynched here, let me not use the train? No. But we know from a som somatic standpoint that uh, mama told me to stay from over there, right? Grandma, grandma always held my hand extra tight when we crossed this intersection. Something, something smells different here, right? I brought a, tr a cohort of people to Savannah um, to do some, uh, some participant observation around transportation planning two years ago, Savannah, Georgia. And the black participants in the cohort, which there were only a few, um, had visceral reactions to being in the space with no explanation, right? Crying, couldn't eat. And what I had to explain to them and everyone else in the group is we are in one of the earliest known ports of entry for enslaved Africans in this country. We're literally walking on cobblestone that was laid uh, by the hands of our ancestors, no one knows this, right? But you feel it. And so our, our, our data crisis that we're experiencing is going to require us as practitioners to be thinking with our spirituality, to be thinking with our emotions, to be thinking with our ancient intellect and not the intellect that we get from school 
um, to, to start to solve some of these issues, right? And so the question is, well, what's the transportation intervention for that? Well, it's healing, right? It's transformative justice work. It's harm reduction, right? It's, it's human-centered work. It's not always going to be a new signal or a new bike lane. So I know that that was a long answer to that was not really an answer, but um, we can't expect our in institutions to take on this work in this way. Us as practitioners have to just embody the work in our day-to-day -day lives, and we have to stop looking to our supervisors or to our agency general managers to buy into the work. They're not going to because that's not cost effective for them. But that doesn't mean that you as a practitioner can't do it, right? So it's your moral obligation as an individual to do your work every day in a different way. Maybe the system will change and adapt to you, but even if it doesn't, you still have to do the work in a way where your ancestors would be pleased with what you've done. Wonderful. Um, our last <laughs> question, um, and I know we only have three minutes left, so I'm going to be brief. I'm just going to read it. Have you experienced a community that has been over-surveyed or experienced engagement fatigue? How did you re-engage them for the current effort and regain trust? So I know you gave a couple yeah. of examples of that, but but feel free to, to give another example if you like. Yes. Yeah. So when you're dealing with community engagement, uh, engagement fatigue, um, you need to prioritize direct intervention work. So in, instead of just um, going out and surveying the same community again, we're showing up at the um, at the laundromat and we're we're buying out the laundromat per day. We're paying for everybody's loads and, and washers and dryers. Um, you got to sit there and wait two hours anyway. So you know, let's talk about what's going on um, with public transportation while we sit, right? Or showing up to the car wash where we know you're going to sit for at least 30 minutes. We're paying, we're covering your wash and we're talking about how your car is causing trauma and harm in our neighborhood, right? So what is the di direct intervention that is of high priority to people in the neighborhood? How can you support them in that way so that they're not, um, the, the interaction is not a transactional one where you're extracting information and folks are leaving your engagement still in need of something? Fantastic. Um, and uh, it reminds me just of so much that we try and do to really remember the people who are experiencing the harm are the best positioned to develop the solutions as much as the rest of the world is kind of stacked against them in terms of being believed and trusted. So that example of the laundromat really resonated with me. Um, so I would, on behalf of Cura and also the Kerwin Institute, like to thank you um, for illuminating um, a really important part of what it means to do this kind of work in a way that really honors um, the mission as opposed to just the assignment, if that makes sense. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, and uh, again, please do feel free to reach out um, and to, um, learn more about Thrivance, uh, Destiny's um, group, uh, and the kind of work that she's doing around the country to really transform how we think about um, the way in which we return or restore or implement, if it was never there in the first place, a moral compass um, for planning. Uh, thank you again, and thanks to everyone for joining us. We wish you a, a wonderful, safe, and restorative weekend. Thank you.